Occasionally, a book gets published that one would define as bad. If the barriers to entry are so high, how does that happen? Somebody else really liked it. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, you will be able. One of the things to start thinking of as a writer is to stop thinking of books as being bad or good and saying, who is the audience for this book? And how well did they match their audience? Okay? Um, I'll, I'll give a famous example of a bad book um, that we would call bad. Okay? Um, so, um, in the 90s, there was a fantasy publishing boom. Uh, it was really kicked off by Robert Jordan. Um, but uh, I would say that Tad Williams had a, had a lot to do with it as well. Um, and there was this boom of people buying hardcover fantasy novels, which hadn't happened before. What happened is a lot of the people who had been reading fantasy, which was pretty new as a genre comparatively. If you look at some of the tradition, I mean, Tolkien and, um, and, and C.S. Lewis and some of these, it's, it's kind of a modern sort of thing, even more modern than science fiction. People have been reading that, suddenly had the disposable income to buy nice hardcovers. And that's what drives, um, during the 80s and 90s, what drove a lot of books, you know, before the ebook revolution. The hardcovers are where you made a lot of your money. People were suddenly buying hardcovers, and there became a fantasy gold rush. Okay? Uh, fantasy gold rush of the 90s, um, where the big success story being Terry Goodkind. Uh, Terry Goodkind wrote Wizard's First Rule. Um, it was a brand new book <coughs> that had a lot of potential. Um, it was right after, um, right after uh, Jordan had gotten big and then Martin had just published um, the, the first of the Game of Thrones. Um, and other people are doing this. Robin Hobb was right that era uh, with Assassin's Apprentice taking off. There's just like this big boom. Suddenly all this stuff's happening. He comes in with us. They have a very big book auction. He's got a great agent, Russ Galen. Um, auctions the book around. Um, it goes for um, reportedly, um, I could be wrong on this, but reportedly I think I've said to you guys before, $750 for three books. So $250 per book, which was an unheard of amount for a fantasy novel um, at, that, in that, at that time. So people were paying six figures for big books. Um, at this time, there was seen as the fantasy gold rush. And during this time, editors started snatching up things that felt like Robert Jordan or Terry Goodkind or Jar Jar Martin. And the quality that we may put it may not have been as high on some of these books as those. Um, some cases they may have been. Uh, some cases they weren't. And they, there was a sense that you put a lot of money into it, like they put into Terry Goodkind, and you can make a bestseller. And all the publishers are like, we need to have a couple of these tent poles. You see it happening in film a lot too, right? A big thing happens, and it was like, we need a tent pole like that. And so they all went out and bought them. Um, there is a famous um, book called The Fifth Sorceress. I can't remember the author's name. Um, but same exact thing happened. Um, Goodkind hadn't read a lot of fantasy. He just kind of did it on his own. Um, this guy had only read Goodkind and did it on his own and came with this, this book that felt somewhat Goodkindy. Um, and it felt like it tapped into this. Um, the book was also horribly misogynistic, had a terrible deus ex machina, um, didn't really come together, and was and by all accounts, a bad book. But their idea was that they were really excited about this. They paid a ton of money for it, went for a big auction. They put epic fantasy on, of the year on the cover before it was released as part of the cover lettering. Like, it wasn't just like a quote that someone gave. They like, actually wrote it like the title, The Fifth Sorceress, Epic Fantasy of the Year. It was the subtitle. Um, and they released this book trying to tap into this. And it is, it is kind of the, the big famous water world of fantasy books, right? It was the big, huge super flop um, that came out. And you can argue that people got too excited about this and weren't watching the quality enough. You could argue that people reacted that the quality was there, but people just reacted against the presumption of the, now you're going to buy this because we tell you you're going to. Um, whatever the reason, mockery abounded of the book. And a lot of times expectations, like if people are told you're going to love this, then they'll react against it and make fun of it. It did have some very strange mis misogynistic things. Like one of the reasons I think they picked it up is that, you know, Robert Jordan had this cool gender roles thing where like men, if they use the magic, go insane. Um, and, you know, it's got this reversal where the women are kind of in charge because the, wim uh, the, the magic works for them. And, you know, but it, he, he did it very delicately and very interestingly. In The Fifth Sorceress, if women use magic, they go evil and become lesbian S&M um, 
Dominatrix. dominatrixes if they use the magic. Um, yes, uh, this was like six figures, high six figures was paid for this book. Um, but you can see how it feels kind of Robert Jordan y. And they're like, this is just like that, and things like this. But then you read this book, and it's uh, this really strange thing about like the guy's sister goes this and turns into one of these sex crazed dominatrixes and all the evil women are trying to rape him as the main protagonist who's like this bastion of goodness that if only women would stay stupid and not get involved in the magic they'd be okay uh, and it just flopped hardcore that's one reason a reason a bad get book gets published they thought they were targeting their market who knows what the, but they, they thought it was, it was a, a good book in these traditions, but they were chasing the tradition instead of making the tradition um, and things like that. Uh, other ways that bad goods get, books get published, though, you can argue that, you know, that some of these books are working. You'll say, this book is terrible, but people love it. Well, that doesn't mean it's terrible. It means that they have targeted their audience and you're not it. Um, and there's a division there, I really feel, that you need to start kind of paying attention to. That, that second thing you said is kind mm -hmm. of how I feel about the Bread Weeks Way of Shadows. Okay. It's like, I read it, and it's like trashy science fiction, like trashy fantasy. Uh -huh. And I'm sure someone out there just like really loves it, but I, you know. Yeah, a lot of people really love it. You should try his other series, um, which I feel is stronger, um, Lightbringer. Um, but yes. Uh, the, the, you're going to find this with everything. There are certain authors out there that I don't like at all, but other people love. It's probably not because the writing is bad. It's probably because the writing is wrong for me. Nobody really liked The Fifth Sorceress. That's probably they were chasing the market. They got overly enthusiastic about something that was not high quality. And, but you can kind of see how that would happen to things like that. So there's a lot of reasons why a quote-unquote bad book gets published. Um, yeah. I don't, you're not the target audience. But the other argument is that sometimes the editors are not, you know, not as good a cape keepers as people assume them to be. <coughs> and that's why the self-publishing movement, one of their big rallying cries is, let the public decide.